Prologue, August 1482 A man other than my husband sits on England's throne today. He is healthy and still relatively young. He has two fine young sons, an utterly loyal younger brother. Another brother, the disloyal one, has long since been disposed of in the efficient way this man has. A lovely queen, a parcel of marriageable daughters. Sometimes, as I sit in my chair at Dampierre and watch the sun setting over the Loire, I amuse myself by wondering what would happen if this king suddenly went mad or simply died young. Would his nobles start to fight among themselves? Would his heir be cast aside? Would those whom he thought most loyal prove disloyal? And above all, what would his queen do? Would she make the same mistakes I did? Or would she learn from mine? For I made plenty. But soon, the Lord and King Louis willing, I shall be laid near my parents to Métanger, having at last followed the men I loved to the grave. Then my maker shall hear my story, and theirs as well. When our tales are at last told together, as they should be, the Lord and anyone else who cares to listen shall judge us all for good or for ill. There is nothing I can do now with my life in back of me other than to pray for mercy and hope that he will be kind. Part 1. Lady of Peace 1. Margaret, May 1444 to May 1445 I became my Henry's queen long before I saw him at Tours in 1444 to be precise. I was fourteen. My marriage was supposed to end a conflict between England and France that had been going on for decades before I was even born. You will be our lady of peace. My uncle by marriage, King Charles VII of France, informed me. I had come to Tours with my father, King René of Anjou, whose sister Marie was Charles's queen, and my mother, Isabel. The English delegation had just inspected me, though introduction was the word everyone had used. They were satisfied then? I asked. My dear, how could they not be? I have always said that I hid a treasure at Angers, my father said. Charles halfway raised his eyebrows before he caught himself. I suspected that he was thinking that I was my father's only treasure, for it was true that my father was not, for his position, an especially wealthy man. Though he was known as King of Sicily and Jerusalem, Duke of Bar, Lorraine and Anjou, and Count of Provence, his title to Jerusalem was flimsy, it had to be admitted, and he had given up his quest for Naples two years before. His lands of Maine were under English occupation. What dowry shall I have? I asked. It seemed only right that I as the bride should know. Majorca and Minorca, my uncle said, and I winced. If anything was as empty as my father's claim to Sicily and Jerusalem, it was his claim to Majorca and Minorca. And twenty thousand francs. Well, of course, the English shall get a two-year truce. I suppose that counts also. It was humiliating, being sold so cheaply, even with the truce thrown in. My distress must have shown on my face, for Charles said, You see, my dear, they want this marriage and peace as much as we do, and frankly, they need it more. The sixth Henry isn't the warrior his father was, by all reports. Not a warrior at all. But a good man, they say, added my father, 